I was the number two in Europe, and now we're 50 people in Europe, 50 worldwide. And I'm very excited to talk about DC charges. Hi, um, Lauren Pammer. I'm a program director at the Green Finance Institute. I run our program for the our coalition for the decarbonisation of road transport. So it's all about how we can bring together, as Nicola was saying, public and private sector finance to mobilise the uh, mobilise capital that's needed to decarbonise. Good morning, David Tozer. I'm head of land and maritime transport at Innovate UK. As Innovate UK, we've been involved in the decarbonisation of transport since 2007, and are now actively involved across automotive, rail maritime and connected on autonomous vehicles. Uh, good morning everyone, I'm Lloyd Allen, uh, the Go Ultra Low West project manager at Bristol City Council. Also uh, I've lived, uh, worked, been raised in Bristol all my life so welcome to everyone, it's really good to see you here. So I've, uh, I've been working in the council for over a decade, I've been working on electric vehicle infrastructure since 2018 and I'll be hopefully, probably engaged in one of uh, Councillor Beach's main uh, issues to solve over the next few years, which is how we get all those charge points into the city. But essentially, any conversation involving electric vehicles and infrastructure, I tend to find myself brought into. So that's me. <laughs> what a great panel. And it's, it's really interesting um, with the scope of work that we've got on the stage. I mean, we're representing Europe here one of, as well, Tritium, as well as our one of the largest OEMs, automotive manufacturers with Volkswagen. So I think we're going to be um, able to ask a lot of questions. And on that, have you spotted on the app, there's not only a chat, there is a Q&A. So if you see me looking at my phone, I haven't lost the plot. I'm looking at your questions, which I will then ask. So if you can make yourself familiar with that, that really helps because as nice as it is to hear from us, I think we also want to hear from the people that have come because there's a, you all want to have the change made and we only can do that if we understand what you're all thinking and feeling. So that would be great. Well, what we've done is we met prior to this session so we could swap some notes and have a think about what we'd like to share with you. And I think one of the most poignant elements that we, we drew upon was how much charging infrastructure are we actually going to need? I mean, of course, we know with the transport hierarchy, as Nicola said, we need to be actually removing vehicles from the roads. We get that. But those that are needing to be swap from an internal combustion engine to an electric vehicle, they're going to need the infrastructure to support it. So I suppose I'd like to come to our DC representative, our rapid charging client here, uh, and uh, ask, what do you think is going to be the critical mass for public for the DC charging infrastructure? That's a great question. Um, I think there's a lot of people who have uh, done lots of uh, scientific research uh, into, into that in magic number. Uh, I know that the European Commission is looking to, to add about 50,000 uh, fast charges throughout Europe for the 30 million cars that are expected uh, by then, by 2030. Uh, first of all, I think uh, the 30 million is uh, not going to happen. I think it's going to be a lot more. I think it's going to go faster. So, because, of course, <clears throat> looking at some of the uh, more advanced countries like Benelux and especially Norway, where we already are achieving, you know, uh, almost 100% penetration of electric vehicles, uh, prior to 2025, which is their um, uh, horizon, uh, they're going to probably reach it already in 2023. And then the ratio, DC charging uh, versus cars, um, there's a couple of numbers. Um, so that ratio that, that I just mentioned, 30 million versus 50,000, that's like 600 charges per car. Um, if you look at, uh, I'll call it the granddaddy of DC charging, which is Tesla, uh, which is deploy, has deployed charging infrastructure, fast charging infrastructure from, from 125, 150 kilowatt onwards um, for their, for their uh, fleet of cars, 500,000 Teslas uh, roughly uh, to date in the world and of course rapidly increasing, uh, about 16,000 DC fast charges around the world. That's a, rate, a ratio of 30, so that's 20 times more. So I think we're hugely conservative on those predictions. So I think we need maybe not 20 times more, but at least 10 or 15 times more than what everyone is, uh, is uh, thinking. Wow, that's actually quite a sobering thought. It's something we've grappled with quite a lot, particularly when the Gold Low Fund was awarded to the West of England Combined Authority, because we needed to work out how many rapids, well, we call them rapids, but of course you just referred to them as fast, so there's number one. <laughs> 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 and, and language barrier. But um, also, Lloyd, let's come to you and think about how did the project decide the volume of rapid versus fast charges for the west of England? 
Sure. So um, essentially, as part of the Go Ultra Low West project, of which you've played no small part in the previous role, Sarah, um, you know, it's only too well. We had we were one of the Go Ultra Low cities to uh, get the funding in 2016, and we decided to split the funding that we had uh, as four local authorities on the project. So not just Bristol, but South Gloucestershire, Bath and North East Somerset, and North Somerset councils. We decided let's let's start with uh, let's just split it by population and let's just divide up charging infrastructure that way. Um, you know, perhaps there was arguments to say maybe we should have done a much more complicated bit of analysis on driver behaviour and so on. But essentially, we wanted to to share it out fairly. Uh, and I think just reflecting on that, um, we from where we kicked off go ultra low west we know that we need a lot more charge points than we have been able to build and are still building. So as a local authority, we had a lot to learn about how to choose sites, where to put them, uh, learn about the right charger in the right location, um, and then we had to learn how to design and build sites. We decided to, to build that uh, those key skills in-house, which of course aren't necessarily core skills of a local authority. So we, we've learned a lot of lessons. Uh, we think we're ready to move faster now but we know for sure that the demand for electric vehicles has certainly increased from those projections that we looked at as part of Go Ultra Low West. Um, but so we, we, we think we know where to put charge points now. We think we know where the right charge point is for the right location. But what we certainly know is there needs to be a lot more. And what you did so well was you did consult, so there was a consultation with the public and they were able to actually put a pin on a map to show where they felt needed a charger and it's surprising how many wanted it right outside their house. <laughs> and I guess on that, we know there needs to be a balance, right? We need the rapid charging network across the sort of public roads. We need those who can charge at home to do so. It's very helpful for the grid if you charge overnight and it's cleaner and greener and less carbon intensive. We also need to rely on the super motorway highway networks like the grid serves of the future and our um, now called grid serve electric highway. But we've also got workplace and destination charging and it strikes me the local authority has always a lot of responsibility on its shoulders but what about the private sector and how can we work more cohesively together because the private sector is more agile and can move faster and a lot of that's often down to funding. So Lauren, let me have your insights on this. How can we close the gap between public and private sector? Um, I think it's all about collaboration and we need to bring together the private and the public sector to understand what's actually stopping that private sector investment. So when we talk to financial institutions, a big risk that they see is that utilisation risk of charge points and just uncertainty around where the demand and the supply are going to interact. So I think there's a role for public sector to play in de-risking some of that private sector investment and just trying to um, almost kind of reassure the private sector that actually it's the right time to invest in this, that, you know, it's not hydrogen, it's electric, there's some doubt around that as well, um, the risk of stranded assets. So I think there's a big knowledge piece to play for um, private capital and also a role for public sector to de-risk it. But it's only by talking to each other and, and bringing those groups together that I think you really understand what those barriers are and, and how to break them down. Really, really thoughtful. Thank you. I, I see Innovate UK as having a major part to play in that. Of course, data is key and extracting data from um, the vehicles themselves. I wonder if it was possible, Oliver, if you could share some insight. How is Volkswagen contributing to this data piece that's so important in predicting what these numbers need to be? Um, well, when it comes to the, the data for charging, I think it's... Um, it's about predicting, trying to predict where electric vehicles are going to be. Um, and for us, the challenge seems to be for people, particularly on uh, intercity traveling, uh, to make sure you can get a charge on longer journeys. I think people are comfortable in driving in their own locations around their towns. They need to understand the longer journeys. And that's about modeling and trying to, um, to work with the government as well. Uh, I know there's investigations going on at the moment about uh, motorway service points and, and, and trying to increase. We're working with um, a number of suppliers, uh, looking at how we can supply rapid charging infrastructure as well. Uh, we have some innovative, um, relatively low cost solutions, which we expect to roll out relatively soon. And um, yeah, it's a little bit chicken and egg. I think everybody is in the room is going to say the same. Um, the more cars there are, the more, the more likelihood there is people are going to invest. People won't buy the cars and, and, until they see the charging points. But I think we're in that point now, we're changing 
uh, and uh, yeah, I think together working with government, working with local authorities, uh, there's there's work that can be done there to, uh, to give confidence. It's not a very good answer, I'm afraid. But the data is really something I think it's about modelling the, the the future volumes. Well, I'm not forgetting Volkswagen Group was one of the first to help public by putting the Tesco's partnership in place where you could charge with pod points. So that really, really hats off to that. I think the role of regulation and the barrier to adoption is something that David can definitely talk us through. And I think that's really important if we collate all of that data from the OEMs, the manufacturers, collate all that data from public opinion and, dare I say it, social media and seeing what's really happening out there. But underneath it all, underpinning it all, is regulation and policy. Let's hear from David. Thanks, Sarah. So... <laughs> Regulation does play a fundamental role and I think its connection and its relationship with innovation is one which does need to be very, very positive and work in harmony. Now we saw a report released um, a couple of months ago now on the Task Force for Innovation, Growth and Regulatory Reform, which put forward a number of proposals where innovation and regulation can coexist in harmony um, to enable the UK to you know, deliver against a lot of the things that it wants to do in an agile uh, non-bureaucratic and productive way and one of the ways in which we've already seen success in tra transport is with regards to sandboxes. Now sandboxes were used to great effect in connecting autonomous vehicles and the advent of the seven test beds that we now have in the UK where regulation and innovation was coming together in a way in which that innovation could flourish in proportion to the challenge, the risks and the benefits that were associated with connected and autonomous vehicles. And the application of sandboxes is certainly something which couldn't be expanded out to EV charging through to hydrogen, V to G and others. And to coincide with that, there's also the opportunity for scale boxes. We want to do more in terms of infrastructure deployment, but we need to try and do it in a way which UK companies can certainly flourish. And those scale boxes is one just is one way of achieving that. So yes, give them the regulatory landscape to succeed, give them the innovation and the support to derive that innovation, but do it in a way which is going to allow those businesses to grow and hopefully become unicorns for the UK. And then we can together hopefully see that succeed. And that is why I think regulation and innovation in the next few years is going to be pinnacle in trying to you know, reach some of the aspirations and some of the targets that the UK is aspiring for. I agree. And just before we go to questions, thanks for using the app. That is really helpful to me and it saves us having to run around with the microphones. I'll come back to you, Lauren, just to build on this. Um, how does regulation unlock finance in your experience? Yeah, so uh, regulation is, is definitely important. And I think the 2030 ban actually has done quite a lot to really accelerate investment because it's given investors that certainty that this is the direction of travel. Um, things like carbon taxes on higher emitting companies as well, I think will help. And um, we also need finance mechanisms and specifically sort of that public finance infrastructure with a clear mandate to share the risk. Um, so yeah, I think it's just the specific, it, within, um, I think within the, the sort of pools of capital that is needed, it's not just one wall of money. So it's not a case of one piece of regulation unlocks the whole lot. I think it's a real sort of series of different barriers for different parts of the transport ecosystem and uh, different finance mechanisms that are going to be needed to do that as well. Mm, different finance models as well, you know, it's something that gets grappled with a lot in procurement, particularly in local authority, how best to fund the charger and how long should that payback period be? And it's vexing and you can only learn from one another. I think that's something the UK does do really well is share experience and events like this really help. Now, Dominic Quenell, thank you for your question. I'm going to read it out. It says, for local top-up charging, grazing, what is the panel's view on wireless charging? When will car and van manufacturers start offering charging plates on the vehicles that they sell? Do you want to tackle that one? Yeah, we've done a lot of research into wireless charging. Um, as this technology stands today, we think there's too much energy loss uh, in the charging uh, through wireless to make it a technology that's ready at this time. Uh, we are experimenting with trucks, with pantographs. Uh, we have uh, trials running in Scandinavia and in Germany um, with trucks which are hybrid and pantograph goes up on certain stretches. Um, so there are some alternatives, but wireless charging at the moment, it's a technology probably still in its infancy and not yet ready. Of course, Panzergraf, those don't know, is where the 
comes down from the roof. Yeah, <laughs> Every, we must be careful as a panel to remember that we're not all experts. Sometimes people will come to these events and then say, oh, yeah, that's, that's just one. So would you like to comment? Yeah, sure. No, I think um, you're right. It's, um, it has, a, has its place. Uh, I would say probably fleet could be a, a good place to, uh, to put uh, wireless because there's some regular regulations around, uh, you know, drivers using uh, cables and plugs and so on. And you have a certain type of uh, standardization, sort of grade of standardization amongst vehicles and charge uh, positions. I think for the public space, um, I think first of all, uh, uh, the, there's limitations on the, on the speed of charging. Uh, and there's also limitations on the safety around public space in terms of um, uh, you know electromagnetic radiation and uh, some other technical aspects uh, and it's quite costly um, so a good alternative is uh, something that tritium has pioneered with uh, ionity uh, you know which is also part of uh, Volkswagen group investing. yeah investor in Volkswagen group um, is the uh, the plug and charge uh, capability so at least you 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 take out that extra step of tapping your card or using your credit card uh, you basically plug plug in and charge now everyone is using the tesla network knows how that works and it's uh, it's super easy and uh, i think that's probably the way forward yeah, wireless charging has really captured the hearts and minds of the general public. I think everyone just really likes the idea that you can be super lazy, <laughs> drive the vehicle over the charge plate and off it goes. And that plug and play technology is right there. So the car essentially is the RFID card or the authenticator for the charger. So you don't have to do anything. You just, it talks to one another. Um, but there's so much more to unlock with that with data and privacy, but I think that'll be covered on a later session. So I dare not, I dare not delve. But there is another question in the group. Thank you, Keith Budden from Senex. He says, how can we get more peer-to-peer -peer sharing of EVs and charge points? I feel like this is a Lloyd question. Uh, yeah, so in terms of we need lots more charge points for the city for there to be enough charge points to persuade people towards uh, mass adoption. Uh, Bristol is a city that doesn't need a lot of, in, lot of encouragement towards that, uh, but there still needs to be a lot more charge points. So for me, uh, as someone working in a local authority, for me the goal of the work that I do is to ultimately encourage EV uptake to contribute towards the city objectives that were that Councillor Beach talked about earlier. So for me, it's not necessarily about purely the income that we can generate from our own network. So as a local authority, we we own our assets, we operate a network. Um, other people up, like run the systems for us, and we uh, obviously don't make our own charge points. So there is part of that is for. Our, we want our charge points to be well utilized so that we can generate enough income to ensure the infrastructure is reliable. But that's not the end goal. The end goal is EV uptake. So there is a wider ecosystem here where, um, and it is difficult for a local authority to be able to encourage particular charge sharing schemes and, and sort of work that out. But um, essentially, I would see that as part of a wider ecosystem. And there are good systems out there where people can share their charge points with each other. Um, I can't endorse one scheme or over another, but I certainly see that as part of the ecosystem, uh, definitely. I can. So <laughs> there's something in Bristol called the Action Net Zero, uh, which is a carbon alliance where some leading brands have got together to try and make a difference, basically. And there's a fantastic app out there called CoCharger. And this is where you can download the app. And if you're fortunate enough to have a home charger, and Electronics install them, so this is how we know all about it, you can allow people to utilize your driveway and your charger for an agreed fee. And the fee can be uh, very reasonable. It can be as flat as your electricity will cost you or you can round it up because ultimately it is a service that you're providing so it's up to you it's a community-based thing it's supposed to be long term people can use it as they come and go but i really like the idea because as lloyd says it does unlock that problem for many where the common objection is i would but i can't charge at home and perhaps the workplace isn't ready for them perhaps the destination charges aren't ready for them either and on that there is what we are going to go to the audience there is a mic roving around apparently but there's one more from neil swanson thank you from the electric vehicle association in scotland he says, on the subject of hashtag journey charges, he means rapid, will larger, higher density batteries charge slowly, not reduce the overall number needed? This is about the ratio we were talking about earlier, I think. The price for charging will be a key driver here in maintaining equitable pricing. Thoughts from the panel? Sorry, I didn't get that question completely. It's, it's beautifully written, but I think it essentially <laughs> means with the rapid charger network out, and about, yeah. but also versus the car batteries becoming longer range, will that ratio decrease? 
Right. Yeah, good question. Uh, that's a question we get uh, a lot, especially for people starting in the business and uh, wondering, you know, will, will we need that kind of uh, number of charges in the future? Um, a lot of discussions we had with OEMs, uh, including Volkswagen, um, you know, talking about what would be the ideal size of a battery, uh, you know, versus the number of charge points and the, and the speed of charging. And uh, honestly, uh, what we have today with like, you know, sort of around 75 kilowatt hour batteries in a car is, is quite an optimum for the current battery technology, for the lithium ion battery technology. Um, you know, in terms of size and weight, um, you know, once you increase that, uh, you know, the, 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 the vehicle gets heavier and, you know, it takes just more energy and it, 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 to it tops down, uh, uh, tops off, you know, flattens off. That's probably the better way of putting it. Um, uh, the advantage and also the cost, you know, the cost of a battery is still one third of the vehicle and um, it is decreasing and especially with the numbers that are coming out now, uh, again, Volkswagen doing a great job there. Um, uh, but still, it's, um, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's, a lot, it's, it's still a, a substantial, uh, and also the range now uh, increasing is not so much because of battery space, uh, battery size, it's more about efficiency of the vehicle. You know, uh, uh, less friction, less air resistance, uh, you know, more aerodynamics, um, you know, even the tires uh, play a role. Um, and so you get to uh, ranges of six, seven, eight hundred kilometers, and that's fine. If you, if you cannot, uh, if you want to drive for more than that, there are many ICE vehicles that even don't get 800 kilometers out of a tank. So, uh, so I think that that's, that's a perfect sweet spot. So I don't think the batteries are going to become a lot bigger. Perhaps just a couple of comments from me. Um, we're currently building uh, six, well, we have plans for six gigafactories in Europe with 250 gigawatts uh, together. A first uh, plant is uh, in build in Sweden, second in um, Salzgitter in Germany. Um, we expect as well in Salzgitter to start by the middle of the, of the decade with a so-called solid state battery. Probably the first uh, volume factory uh, for, for solid state in the world. And that's expected to get us to a thousand kilometers per, uh, you know, per car. And then we get into that discussion precisely. Um, if there are enough charges around, will people want a thousand kilometers? For those that, that want it, that the opportunity will be there. Um, you can take smaller batteries, that reduces the weight. Uh, but I think the, the, the other focus is on these gigafactories. Um, we are expecting a 50% cost down in our entry model uh, battery packs. And that's really going to be the cost breakthrough where we can get to a 25,000 euro car uh, that will seat five people um, and starts to become, you know, the real mass market EV that's affordable for everybody. That's really exciting. I hope that answers your question, Neil. Sorry, we are, might have not read it out quite right. Uh, I think what we need to think about is how the consumer behavior change is. And I agree with you. There is a lot of discussion. I have this thing I call pub chat. So for example, if you're down the pub and someone's talking about it, you know it's a hot topic and you know it's finally trickled through from our professional environment through to the public place where people share. And that, that's a common discussion. Do I really need a thousand mile car? And of of course people want it, of course they do, but we've got responsibilities in strike that balance with our long-term investment plans and our infrastructure rollout and our grid connections and volume of charging infrastructure required. So please keep talking to all of the public and keep a handle on it. But as a panel, I'd like to come back to Innovate, please, David. I'd like to ask you what's going on with V2G, V2X, Feature Home? Can you explain to the audience what each of those are and also how Innovate UK is going to help to research before we invest? Thanks. So um, please do stick around for my colleague, Josie Wardle, who will be talking specifically about V2G this afternoon and is by far the most knowledgeable person on that subject. Um, but we as Innovate have um, supported uh, the what is the largest trial of Innovate of V2G uh, within Europe over the course of the last two years, really to understand that technology and to understand how it works from all different modes of uh, transport, from buses right through to passenger car. And we are seeing some very significant um, results from that, from that body of work. And hopefully that will, will allow us to continue the journey um, with the funders, so Bayes um, and indeed OZEV. Um, it is a, a very promising technology, one which will allow a vehicle to be an asset for the home and for the workplace and to see how it can complement the existing supply of energy to that, um, to that other infrastructure. So we're quite keen to understand how it will work, how the business model will work um, and how it affects the user 
And all of those are being wrapped up into that body of work at the moment with a substantive data collection effort going on behind it to really get into the nuts and bolts and, and indeed to inform policy. Um, that is important. If it's going to work, it needs to work for the regulator as well as the consumer. Um, so we're quite excited by that body of work, um, and, but there is certainly more to do um, and we're actively kind of pursuing opportunities within that space now. Um, then in addition to that, we have a substantive unit within Innovate UK that's looking more at the energy side of things. So how can the home and how can the other infrastructure which utilizes energy support vehicles? And how does that interaction work? And indeed, there is a body of work, innovations using companies and using local authorities, using public sector to try and understand how that all works in a holistic manner. And that's often what we're talking about here is not just about transport, it's how that transport interacts with a wider infrastructure. And we're trying to unlock some of those answers through innovation and then through the projects that are ongoing at this time and hopefully over the course of the next few years. Thank you. Something really interesting is happening where suddenly it's been taking all this time for people to understand what they need and want from a charging infrastructure perspective. And that's what we try to do is guide that process. But you do eventually hit a wall, which is a grid connection shaped wall, which requires it's potentially quite an expensive upgrade that the landowner or facility user simply can't pay. So I did want to explore with the panel, please could you share your thoughts on how we could work more closely with our, um, for example, Western Power Distribution or Northern Power Grid, somebody from the DNO, the distribution network, to help us to unlock that potential for more EV charging or even renewable energy. Who would like to go first? You've got the microphone, David, you look pensive, go on. <laughs> um, that's a very good question. For, for me, it is always about collaboration. So collaboration remains key. So what we're seeing is that by bringing a lot of the people that are on the board actually, and a lot of people in the room today together to understand how these challenges are overcome is the way in which we overcome them. And it's not just about doing it within the UK. It's about working with our international partners as well to achieve it. Um, we as the UK are likely to have access to Horizon Europe and they are putting challenges out there which are very similar to those which we have in the UK. So trying to understand what we can do as a country and how that um, duplicates or how that can improve or work with our international partners is, is very important and something that we're big advocates of. Um, that's probably not really answering the question. No, it is a really good point to underpin that knowledge is power. And Lloyd, I know you've got hands-on experience working in the West of England Combined Authority installing, what, three rapid charging hubs? Can we hear from you? Yeah, certainly. We um, so I'm I'm part of the energy service of Bristol City Council, uh, whereas counterparts across the UK could be anywhere from air quality to transport planning. So my the team that I'm in have a very already an embedded experience working with, closely with the DNO. In our case, it's Western Power. We felt that we needed to before we started to plan where charge points went as part of our project. We decided we needed to get in the room with Western Power and. Um, say to them, look, this is the impact of our project. This is the number of charge points. Uh, we don't quite know yet where we want to put them, but this is a lot of power we're asking for. Is this going to be a problem for you? And how can we tell you what we're doing? And how can we work strategically? Had a very positive response. Um, it, it took a little while to work out how that information that we had was best passed on, but it was very clear that we had a very uh, willing second person in that conversation which was western power so it's not to say that the process of uh getting a connection has been always simple there's been things we've needed to iron out and improve and western power have responded and in terms of our side better understanding the information that we needed to give but for us it was very important to get early engagement on that front uh to understand the impact of our work i mean in bristol the challenge of uh, is there going to be enough power for all the charge points we want at the moment is less of a problem than perhaps other local authorities. I, I know that the challenge and therefore the grid connection just rockets if you've got if you've got capacity issues. So you can you can put together a budget for a charge point, take an average and then put a, a request for a new connection form in and then it comes back as 10 times the amount and you have to think again. So getting in there early build a relationship with your DNO as a local authority, absolutely key. 
It's really good advice and definitely one to take on. And thank you for all the chat and Q&A comments. Just going to give a chance to ask a question in person if anyone wishes. We've still got tons to get through. So if you wanted to ask a question in person, please do raise your hand now. Otherwise, I'll continue with the app. One at the back there. Can't see. I think it's Jacob. <laughs> thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Jacob Roberts from REA. Um, I was wondering what the panel's view were, was on uh, zero emission vehicle mandates and the role that they can play to accelerating electric vehicle uptake in the UK. Great question. Anyone want to kick off? I think a little bit like the 2030 announcement, it can do a lot to, to catalyze and sort of send those demand signals. So personally, I think it's probably a good idea. It needs a little bit more research on it. But I think what it will do is, is make that sort of 2030 target, turn it into more of a short term target and really just send that signal to investors and importantly, I think, to consumers that this is the route we're taking and therefore they really need to get on board. So I think that, that signaling is a big part of that mandate and, and that will help. It's, it's an interesting one because um, the CO2 targets that we have to achieve are only achievable by selling a certain number of zero emission vehicles. So it's, it's sort of happening anyway. Um, it's perhaps signaling and it's given a strong signal to people that what has to happen. But I think the manufacturers are going to achieve uh, those mandated numbers anyway. I think the bigger question is what's a hybrid? Uh, and, and that's a real question that the government's struggling with at the moment. Are we talking about hybrids which charge from their petrol engine, so they're really petrol cars, or are we talking about hybrids which plug in and maybe up to 100 kilometers of power is driven um, electrically with renewable energy? Uh, and I think that's a difficult question that the government needs to answer. If we can get there, then I think we can perhaps have a chat about um, what, the, what the mix is of zero emission vehicles. Um. If I just may comment, I'm not an expert on this subject, but uh, if, I, if I look at the hybrids, um, I think you'll find that uh, a lot of people who drive hybrids um, don't even charge their cars. Um, so that's also something to take into account. I know of quite a few people driving hybrids that use the, the electric motor to accelerate faster uh, or get, get just more out of a tank. But, but yeah, I th to me, I think it should be more focused on fully electric. Yes, and it's really interesting with the hybrid debate because, of course, you can't deny it has captured the hearts and minds of the public because it's that sort of safety stepping stone between the two. And I do think in five, ten years' time, we'll look back and wonder what the fuss was about because it is moving towards electric and that price parity is coming down. Great question from Richard Drew here from the Energy Saving Trust. There's been a lot of conversation about charging infrastructure. But, <laughs> just take that personally, but is there or should there be anything more done to make vehicles more affordable? Looks like Lloyd's going to answer. Sure. Um, I guess also connected to the last question as well. So, um, for me, if uh, if if people have only got the choice to get electric vehicles, then great. I can achieve the, the we, we can achieve the the targets of our project if people have to get electric vehicles. But I, I'm also conscious that um, we've one of the projects that Councillor Beach mentioned is our try before you buy commercial electric vehicle scheme, and we are because of inevitable delays in getting that project set up with recent challenges that project is likely to be going live around about the time that our clean air zone comes in and for me that's for a number of reasons not amazing timing so um so for me i i would love there to be more electric vehicles and i would i'd love that to be the case but but um so over the summer, I've had the joys of renovation works going on at home, and I've had uh, various contractors coming in, <clears throat> and every day they get fed up with me saying, hey, so is your next van going to be electric? Uh, all the comments are around, oh, charging of a can't take the load, too expensive. Um, for me, I've really kind of understood their problem in that uh, for me, I can go and without too much difficulty get an electric vehicle for my use. But there's other users that are really key in this and commercial sector is quite important, especially they're going to be the ones affected more by clean air zones. So sorry if I've blurred the questions here, but I think there's a real role in understanding access to those vehicles. Mm, we're going to come to Lauren in a second. The total cost of ownership, so TCO, total cost of ownership, often gets overlooked as well, because I know from my own experience that driving a family five-seater diesel was costing me the same as my brand new 
Kia e-Nero 300 mile range vehicle, same per month. So by the time I'd sold the thing and rent and leased this one, I'm, I'm no worse off having a full electric. In fact, I think I'm saving money because I'm using an agile tariff. So it's just that message isn't getting through. You can break even if not save. And that is just a very simple message to put forward. And that's not that's without even trying. So sometimes let's hear from Lauren. Well, no, that was going to be one of my points. Actually. Sorry. <laughs> it's all right. I was going to say total, total cost of ownership and making consumers more aware of that and what it actually means. And that might mean simplifying the language. So calling it pocket price or, or something like that. Um, so I think there's definitely a need for, um, for the awareness of that to be raised. But we're also looking at things like whether means tested loans for EVs could be an option um, to help in the short term and, and really help to build I think the momentum in perhaps parts of society who aren't interested in EVs today because they do see it as, as too expensive. Um, because I think you're right about your conversation in the pub. A lot of this is, is, it is word of mouth. And actually, it's only when you really sit and have a conversation with someone that you start to bust those myths and, and really get them to understand that it could be affordable for them. At the moment, they just see the list price on the front of the car and they forget that you know 92 percent of new cars are bought using finance so they're not ever paying that list price most of them are paying a monthly amount and it's so it's about telling them what that monthly amount means uh, just yeah, a few sure. comments uh, just to add to that i think um when you look at the tax status at the moment as well uh evs are very competitive um but i think there's there's two or three things one is there is a lot of innovation coming around battery chemistry and costs are coming down. As I said earlier, uh, for the entry models, we think batteries will go down by about 50% and um, for the volume models by about 30% in the next couple of years. Um, I think there's only one way that petrol and diesel cars are going to go. The cost is going to increase. First of all, the emission technology is becoming much, much more difficult and therefore more expensive. Government has a role to play. Uh, I think for the last 10 years, the government has missed the, f the uh, fuel tax increase, which was mandated by law. So petrol and diesel isn't getting more expensive uh, while taxes have been loaded onto electricity. And I know there's a big debate around that uh, um, at, at the moment. But I would perhaps just, just point people towards one thing. It's very uh, timely today. Our CEO has actually posted on LinkedIn this morning. He's taken three electric cars and he's actually done that cost comparison to the equivalent uh, petrol or diesel car. And it shows in every case, surprise, surprise, uh, that the electric car is more affordable. But I think the, the key issue as well is what was said earlier, that the cars are financed and that total cost of ownership argument, um, EVs are in terms of the running costs for most users already substantially cheaper and that's only going to go in one direction. Very good point. Um, I read that. Um, that post from uh, Herbert Dies, um, and I was, I mean, uh, delighted, but also a little bit surprised because he's basically saying, "Look, don't buy um, an, an internal combustion engine uh, car anymore, but you're still making heaps of them, and you will be still making them after 2030, and there are still markets for it. So fair enough, and you have your vested, uh, your your investments and your your plans and so on. Fair enough, um, but." Coming back to um, you know making the, the public aware of total cost of ownership and all the advantages of an electric vehicle versus a, a, a petrol vehicle, um, I think there's maybe also some work to do still uh, at the dealership level, uh, where maybe uh, not always uh, you know the the electric car is not always uh, promoted over the uh, the petrol car, uh, maybe sometimes at the same level, but often. Um, also, because maybe there's a lack of knowledge at, at the sales level at, at dealerships uh, that they cannot really explain and, and, and answer all those questions. You know, what about charging? What about cost? And uh, what about the battery? Doesn't it deteriorate? And, and, and all that, you know, you, you know, you know what I mean? So, yeah. Uh, I'm in danger of going back to EV charging now just because I love it so much. <laughs> but there's a great question here from Nigel Morris. I really like this one. I've been holding on to this one. I've just been given an extra three or four minutes as well. Thanks for that. So he's from EV Zero and says, recharging for those with no off-street parking. Can a local authority subsidize the rate at commercial charges to simulate out, hang on, simulate out of hours or off-peak cost benefits and de-risk commercial operations. Interesting. I've never thought of the local authority subsidizing it. I thought perhaps it would be something that CPOs chose to do somehow with a kickback somehow. What do we think, panel? Uh, so this is very much part of the problem that we are trying to unpick. So if you are a local authority and you are saying, no, you can't trail a cable, you need to wait for us to put your infrastructure in. That's the way we think is the best, safest way to do it. Um, then as a as a someone who sees other people having the opportunity to charge at home you are 
of thinking, well, my neighbor has access to whatever tariff they've got, and I am paying twice that on the street outside. Um, so for us, we, you know, we are, we've got a piece to do to say, well, okay, maybe you don't necessarily have the same opportunity. Maybe you can't share their charger. Fine. So what we need to do is to find a creative way to have infrastructure that can operate cheaply, that doesn't cost too much to operate, that can then be tariffed lower than other public charging. But also there's uh, opportunities with on off-peak, on-peak tariffs that can come into play. And that is still quite a complex piece to work out. And this is something that we are working out at this moment as we are heading towards a plan for how we do on-street residential public vehicle charging. It's never, in, in terms of the local authority being able to sustain it and run it, uh, we need to be able to have the income coming in enough to be able to maintain what we've got, replace the old charge point, and ultimately to be able to reinvest. So subsidizing is it's it's not necessarily an appealing aspect to that commercial model. But we would, as a local authority, do all we could to provide charging that's cheaper than other public charging. And you already do, and that's to be acknowledged. What a great question. We've only got two minutes left, so I think it's really nice if we went along the panel. Um, and I'll start with Oliver. When thinking that this is the EV World Congress, the World Congress, how do you think the UK is doing compared to the rest of the world? Just as your closing thought, what should we be doing more? Oh, great question. Um, it's all about in, uh, charging infrastructure. Solve the charging infrastructure problem. You know, build it, and they will come. I think that's the uh, th yeah, my closing comment. <laughs> But um, yeah, I think I would uh, say the same thing. I, th I think the last couple of years, probably three, four years, you've seen a, a, a big increase in the number of charge points, especially the, the rapids, as you call them. Um, so that's that's great to see. Um, but I, yeah, I totally agree. I think it's uh, the number of charge points that will get people over that hurdle. And then a lot of education uh, needs to be done still. But that's not just the UK, that's, of course, the whole world. I won't, I won't repeat the point about charging infrastructure, but I think what we do do really well in the UK actually is finance, and we are a kind of leading global centre for green finance. We've, we're, we're issuing more green bonds, for example, than, than anyone else in the world. Um, and I think ahead of COP26 as well, that's really going to focus the world on the UK and, and what we are doing, and that sort of opportunity to, to really sort of galvanise action and, and accelerate the transition. Um, for me, it's the it's the integration of EVs with the wider transport. So everything from buses through to rail. So how does EVs complement public sector transport and how does it complement active travel? How does it complement um, everything from micromobility right through to connected and autonomous vehicles? All that needs to work in harmony. Um, there are some significant challenges as well, um, but certainly there are aspirations to, to try and achieve some of that. Um, but for EVs, they are going to be pretty fundamental, um, and that is both from a private ownership perspective and from a shared mobility perspective. And it's about making sure that they work um, well with other forms of potentially less damaging travel and to make sure that the transport system is working efficiently, effective and effectively and safely. Absolutely, infrastructure. I'd quite be. I'd be very happy in my job building more. But ultimately, it is about that behaviour change, and it's about that that functioning system. So, it, it's 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 about as a local authority, we want to get people, more people, into walking, cycling, public transport. But for those who still need to use a vehicle, is it about? Could you still need a vehicle? Can you use a car club? Can you share? Can you think about mobility as a service? But it's about uh, it's about that behaviour change ultimately. But there's a ton of infrastructure needed in there, absolutely. So all I'm hearing here is collaboration, education, communication, pub chat, <laughs> and the opportunity to build it and they will come. And I think that's been a fantastic close. Well, it's a great panel. Thank you all for donating your time to the EV World Congress today. I hope you've enjoyed it. Please rate us five stars. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you as well to Sarah again for...